admiring him from afar for years and years and years. So I'm very excited to have him here and for you guys to be able to share in my enthusiasm of how cool his work is. Um, he's also kind of a, a neat guy too. So he runs and climbs and he's a Gemini. And so we want all those things about him. So with, without further ado, um, Dr. Scott Creel, thank you very much for coming. And thank you, you guys for being here. And Ramon, thank you for helping with organizing scheduling, logistics, and everything. So, enjoy. All right. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. And uh, I've had a lot of interest me interesting meetings today and uh, enjoyed learning a little bit more about what people are doing here. Um, sorry, my phone's ringing. <laughs> um, but uh, what I'd like to do is talk to you about a new direction my research is taking that basically grew out of um, doing a uh, uh, sabbatical last year at the uh, the Swedish uh, Agricultural University, um, where I have a colleague, Joran Spong, who's doing um, high throughput sequencing, and I was thinking about ways of inclu including uh, molecular genetic data into the research program we're doing on large carnivores, uh, mostly in Zambia now. So this was home last year for a year. Uh, up against the Arctic Circle, living in a cabin that was basically, as you can see, about twice as big as a Volvo. Um, <laughs> two of us and two dogs, that was an experience. Uh, but it came out pretty well. And uh, you know, this is the motivating uh, point behind most of the work that I'm doing these days. 61% um, of the world's large carnivores the species are threatened or endangered. And in, in many cases, you know, we understand the issues that cause those problems pretty well. But in other cases, there are difficult ecological or biological questions lurking in the background that are, that are hard to understand. And that's a lot of what we've been working on. Uh, this is a review paper that came out uh, a few years back now, basically looking at the causes uh, of endangerment for carnivores worldwide. And this is uh, uh, the way this is scaled, basically going from the greens to the reds there. It's the number of carnivores threatened by a given problem in a given place mapped out worldwide. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. You can't have the red values unless you have a lot of large carnivores left in that location, but also you have a lot, a lot of large carnivores threatened by that problem in that location. So the places that map out in, in the warmer colors are both where we have a lot of opportunity because the carnivore community is still intact, but also where that process is, a, is an issue. And you can see that habitat loss and fragmentation, persecution or you know, direct human conflict, prey depletion, and overharvest are, are four of the big issues. And for the species that I'm going to be talking about, I think that's true, that these are you know, important parts of the, the, the human impact. We, we're, the data I'm going to be showing you come from Zambia uh, in southern Africa. Uh, and uh, I'll be explaining a little bit more about why I'm interested in that area. Zambia is important for large carnivore conservation because it still has uh, big protected areas that hold all the large carnivores that were present. You know, none of them have gone extinct in most of these systems. And it creates an opportunity to work in multiple ecosystems and compare information across them. So we're working now in, in the Luangwa Valley over here in eastern Zambia, up near the Malawi border, in Kafui National Park in central Zambia and in Lua Plain National Park over here in the west near the border with Angola. Uh, and again, all the large carnivores are present in each of those three systems. And these are big protected area complexes where the dark green are national parks and the lighter green are game management areas that um, allow trophy hunting but otherwise are set aside for conservation. So, uh, and you know, um, this, this protected area here when you add it all up is more than 30,000 square kilometers by itself. So large protected areas that harbor important carnivore populations uh, is why we're working there. Uh, and the set of animals that we're studying in each of these places, going from large to small, uh, is the African lion, uh, Panthera leo, the spotted hyena, Crocuta crocuta, the leopard, Panthera pardus, the cheetah, Sinonyx jubatus, um, and the African wild dog, Lycaon pictus. If you pay attention to those uh, genus species names, one of the things that might have struck you on the way through is uh, three out of the five of those are monotypic genera. 
uh, you know, these aren't just twigs on the evolutionary tree. They're pretty big branches. And we have two out of the four members of Panthera there. So this guild alone, you're talking about a significant chunk of large carnivore uh, evolutionary history. And that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, the conservation of them is important. But in that carnivore guild, and I, and I went through from large to small, one thing that decades of research by lots of people in many ecosystems has shown is that interspecific competition is a strong structuring force within these carnivore guilds. Because they rely on a heavily overlapping set of prey, they're potentially in competition with one another. Uh, so uh, wild dogs and everything on up the size hierarchy in ecosystems where wildebeest are common, wildebeest will be their most important or one of their most important prey. Uh, so shared use of a limiting resource is what leads to competition. And in the case of the large carnivore guild, it particularly, it's exacerbated by, by the fact that uh, resource competition leads to strong exploitative competition. So all of the adaptations they have for killing prey are also useful in, in competitive interactions with one another. And it's uh, hunt, hunting large ungulates is an energetically expensive way to make a living. So there's always uh, some selection pressure on the large carnivores to simply steal prey from the small carnivores instead of hunting for themselves. A lion could go get a wildebeest, but if it can just steal it from a wild dog, a dead wildebeest is more valuable than a hunting opportunity. So competition is, is quite strong, and it takes the form of uh, direct interactions at carcasses is one of the places where we see it. So food loss is one of the reasons this is important for the supported members of the guild. And then just direct killing also. Uh, the, com the competition between these species is often expressed as intraguild predation, which is basically just an extreme form of competition. It's not predation in the sense of obtaining food because that lion is not going to eat that hyena. It's just killing the, the hyena to eliminate the hyena, but not to eat it. Actually, amazingly enough, this hyena is not being killed. No hyenas were harmed in the making of this talk. Um, <laughs> This uh, photo was taken by Elgil Droga, my PhD student, uh, and he assures me that a few seconds after he took it, the lion dropped the hyena, and the hyena just jumped up and ran off. <laughs> so um, playing dead works. Um, but uh, the outcome of this is that when we look across ecosystems or in ecosystems where we have long time series of the responses of the densities of the subordinate competitors to the dominance, there are negative relationships. So where spotted hyenas are, com oops, where spotted hyenas are common, uh, wild dogs are less common. Where lions are common, African wild dogs are less common. There's an inverse relationship in their densities, probably as, an, as a consequence of the competition. Um, and I want you to note the scales on these, these, these axes here. The, the densities of the dominant competitors go up to much higher values than the densities of the subordinate competitors. So there's a negative relationship. And in every ecosystem where they've been studied, the dominant competitors outnumber the subordinates by an order of magnitude or so quite often. Uh, so you may find 10 times as many hyenas in an ecosystem as you find wild dogs. You can find more hyenas in a single ecosystem than there are wild dogs in all of Africa. Um, so the subordinate competitors are held to low densities as a consequence of this. And competition leads to niche partitioning in this com community like it does in many other communities. So this is the thing I'm going to be pursuing on through, 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 through data on this guild. But one thing that I think it's important to think about when in thinking about the generality of what I might be talking about is that competition is an important structuring force in lots of guilds. And in lots of guilds, you see spatial niche partitioning as a response to that. Um, so uh, that may lead to there being some generality to the results I'm going to be talking about. As I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of data over a long period of time from many ecosystems by many research groups that basically suggest that that negative relationship I was just showing you is causal, that high levels of competition cause low levels of density of the subordinate competitors. Uh, and that that leads to uh, niche partitioning dietarily, temporally, and spatially. And the spatial niche partitioning is what I'm going to focus on a little bit more for now. Uh, this is data from Lua Plains National Park in the western part of Zambia. And it's just showing you a data set from GPS collars on three members of the carnivore guild. Um, there are cheetahs present in that guild, but we, we didn't have good data on them at the time this, this study was done. This distribution is showing you 
where kills occur across the carnivore community as a whole. And it's basically centered, uh, this hot spot here where it's coated as black as low use and, and white as high use, that hot spot is basically the, the center of the, the wet season range of the migratory wildebeest population that uses this area. So, um, you know, this is where the hunting is good, and that's where the lions are camped out. Uh, and this is, a, this is a thing that we see both across ecosystems and within ecosystems, is that the dominant carnivores, their densities correlate with prey density quite nicely. If you're a lion, there's nothing above you in the food web to avoid, so you tend to spend your time where the hunting is best. If you're a spotted hyena, you're, the, their activity is also concentrated in areas of high prey density. But you often see this, so, this sort of pattern where wild dogs do not concentrate their activity in the area where the prey density is highest, because that's also the area where they're most likely to encounter lions. And direct predation on wild dogs by lions is a common cause of death for, for African wild dogs. So instead, they're, they're living out here more on the edges. And in fact, if you look in the details, you see a little hot spot of wild dog activity here in an area that's a hole in the lion and hyena distribution. You see a hot spot of activity out here in a location that's a hole in both the lions and hyena distributions. So statistically, we see a negative association in the use of space. So um, a lot of research by a lot of people suggests that competition is an important structuring force for these guys and that, that spatial niche partitioning is one of the, the, the responses that, that allows the subordinate competitors to persist in an ecosystem. So some people call cheetahs and wild dogs fugitive species because they basically have to live, make their living in the cracks between the lions and the hyena distributions. But we also know that all these ecosystems are not pristine. Even these huge protected areas in sub-Saharan Africa are seeing pretty strong human effects now and one of the biggest effects is through poaching with wire snares. So here you see a patrol that's collected a wire snare. And these are set uh, in order to, um, to catch ungulates. They're being put out not to catch carnivores, but to catch um, the ungulate species for meat. Uh, but preys are, uh, snares are completely non-selective. Once a wire snare has been set, um, you know, the next thing that wanders through is what will be snared. Um, so these have both direct and indirect effects on the carnivores. They have a direct effect by causing snare-induced mortality for the carnivores, but the stronger effect is probably mainly through depletion of prey. Uh, and the way these work is people will uh, basically find a pathway that's likely to be used, and if they don't have a natural break that's going to funnel animals, they'll create one by cutting thorn bushes and basically creating a break. Then you anchor the wire snare to something sturdy, and you set it up as a loop here, uh, and then tie it there with grass, and whatever wanders through next is what's going to be snared. Um, uh, and they're very effective. So prey numbers can be de 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 decreased pretty substantially through this, uh, this wire snaring. Uh, and in looking at how humans may be affecting the competition between the carnivores, we wanted to look at this uh, uh, in a few ways, but the best way we found to look at it was to look at data from the Kafui ecosystem, that one in central Zambia, because for that ecosystem, there was a data set available from the 1960s by uh, Mitchell et al., a guy who was a warden there back in the 60s, collected quite a nice data set on prey selection by all the large carnivores present in the ecosystem. And we had exactly that same sort of data from 50 years later. So we could examine how patterns of prey selection have changed as wire snare poaching has altered prey density, but also altered the composition of the prey community. Uh, so what you see here is these are the data from the 60s, and these are our data from the 2010s. Each row is a carnivore, so leopard, lion, wild dog, cheetah. Um, we don't have good data from spotted hyenas in this system because they're not common in this system. And these are the prey species uh, organized from smallest on the left to largest on the right. So there's 18 columns in that figure because there are 18 ungulate species that are in the diet of at least one of these carnivores. And the sizes of the circles are, proportional, uh, are the proportion of the diet of that carnivore that is made up by that prey species. So what you can see is that in the 60s, uh, there was a broader uh, dietary niche for the carnivores than what we see in the 2010s. Uh, large prey were taken quite often, especially by lions, but they were more represented in the diets of all the carnivores than they are now. 
So not only is prey density going down, but it appears that prey, prey density is particularly being depleted for the large prey species, which have become less important for all of the carnivores, but have also produced this pattern that now all of the large carnivores prey preferentially on a set of only four prey species, which are quite small. So for instance, this dot right here is African buffalo, which in the 1960s were the single most important prey for lions. There are not many buffalo left in the system now, and buffalo are far less important prey species than they used to be. Uh, and the lions were not preying much on small prey back in the 60s, and now their predation is heavily focused on small prey. So the ability of the subordinate competitors to use dietary niche partitioning to reduce competition has been reduced by the lion being squeezed into the prey niche that, that, that they've already adopted. Um, and this summary here basically just shows you that if you look at the changes between the 60s and the 2010s and just ask whether a given pre prey species increased or decreased in what fraction of the predation it represents, the large prey decreased in their importance 21 times out of 25, whereas the small prey uh, increased in importance more often than they decreased. So a change in prey availability, but also a change in patterns of predation that affects the competition uh, between the species. We know that that's at least, at least partly related to differences in prey density. So what we don't have is good data on the prey density back in the 60s. Nobody got that data. But what we do know is that large prey have become less important for the carnivores from the 60s till now. And we know the things that are common in their diets now are the things that are most common on the landscape now. So the, the four species in that last figure that are in this blue box, blue box are puku, impala, warthog, and common diker. Puku, impala, warthog, and common diker. And when you look on this figure here, looking at the abundance of these animals, so this is from uh, seven years of line transect data done systematically across the, the entire study site using uh, generalized distance sampling to measure the density of herds and then fitting zero truncated Poisson models to the same data to estimate effects on herd size. We can get the density of herds and herd size to get individual density on the landscape. And that's what this column here is, is individuals per square kilometer for each of the prey species. And what you can see is puku, impala, and warthog are by an appreciable margin the most abundant prey species in the ecosystem now. And they're also in the, they're the most important prey for all of the large carnivores now as well. So uh, we can't say directly that changes in abundance have produced this pattern, but there's a pretty good argument that that's probably the case. So now, uh, when you're, whether you're a lion or a wild dog or a cheetah or a leopard, when you're walking around this ecosystem, what is mainly available to you is warthogs and impala and puku, all of which are smaller than the median body mass in that ecosystem. So it appears that selective overharvest by people has basically compressed the niches in a way that affects competition, which is bad news for the subordinate competitors. Uh, you know, they rely on niche partitioning to be able to persist with the dominant competitors in the system uh, and with the loss of large prey that used to be preferred by lions, uh, you know, we now have, it, have increased competition. So uh, there's reason to think that within these ecosystems, these human effects that are depleting prey density within the ecosystems is altering the competitive interactions in ways that probably affect the persistence of the subordinate car carnivores beyond just the loss of prey itself which got us thinking about connections between the ecosystems and what ways human effects may be modifying connectivity between these ecosystems. Because for these species, connectivity is a big issue. Uh, these large carnivores uh, live at low enough densities that even very big ecosystems only hold a few dozens to a few hundreds at most. So none of these species have populations that number more than a few hundred individuals. And from the perspective just of demography, but especially of evolution, connectivity between ecosystems is going to be important to maintain the species and the genetic diversity within the species. Um, so we have small populations with even smaller effective population sizes. And Zambia is an important place to think about connectivity for these species for a few reasons. One, we have these big protected area complexes that are large enough 
and in sufficient proximity that it's reasonable to think that they would still be connected for these large carnivores. So just connectivity within Zambia is of interest to us. But also, if you look at the location of Zambia within Africa, it's a pivot point for a lot of the range of these species. Zambia has uh, eight nations neighboring it, uh, and, uh, and it's landlocked. So I mean, it's basically at the hub of the wheel for most of the stronghold populations for most of these species. So you've got the DRC up here in the north, Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, little bit of Botswana right here, Namibia and Angola, all adjacent to Zambia and all, all also holding important populations that may or may not be connected to these Zambian populations. So we are interested in how humans may be affecting the connectivity between these ecosystems. And to look at that, uh, we decided to use an index of human effect on the landscape that was produced by Oscar Venter and a set of his colleagues where basically they mapped out for the entire world at one square kilometer resolution this index of how impacted a location is by human activity. Uh, and they used eight variables to build that index that I think are all reasonable measures of how humans have modified the landscape in terms of making it less suitable for, for large carnivores. So uh, built environments, cropland, pasture land, human population density, Night lights as a measure of the economic development of that, that human population. Railways, roadways, and navigable waterways. These are all ways that we've modified the environment that probably reduce connectivity for these species that I'm talking to you about. And they aggregated them into a single measure that they call the human footprint index. And the, the nice thing about this also is Tucker et al. just last year did an analysis that establishes that this measure can predict the movements of a wide range of species quite well. So they looked at a, a range of species where each dot on this map is a study that had GPS collar data for animals that allowed them to, to look at typical day-to-day -day movements and also long-range movements and relate them to the intensity of the human footprint. So the background shading on this map is the human footprint index from areas with low human footprint in light colors and areas with high human footprint in the darker colors. Um, and the scale of movement for these things that they examined range from things that are moving on you know, a scale of tens of meters to things that are moving on a scale of tens to hundreds of kilometers. And they found pretty consistent effects. So across all those species and locations, this is increasing human foot footprint index on the x-axis, and this is movement on the y-axis. And they did a kind of cool thing in this study where they looked at both the typical movements using the median of the frequency distribution of movements, but then they also looked at the impact of the human footprint on long distance movements by looking at, I can't remember if it's the 90th or the 95th percentile of the frequency distribution of movements. So both the impact upon typical day-to-day -day movements and on the impact on long range movements, which is why this curve is displaced so much higher than this one, is here we're talking about atypical long distance movements that would be what an animal's doing when it's dispersing, whereas over here we're talking about typical day-to-day -day movements that an animal would be doing within its home range. And in both cases, they found a significant negative effect. So we know this human footprint index can measure impacts on animal movements, but to me this raises two questions, and that's what I want to address with our data uh, in the next few minutes. One is, are these relatively short-term effects, are they consistent enough through time to produce genetic consequences? So we know this is affecting their movements on a time scale of a few days that's measured by GPS collars, but we don't know if those effects are consistent enough to produce genetic differentiation uh, that, that the human footprint index would, have, would affect movements at that longer time scale that, you know, that, that's reflected by gene flow. And the other thing that, that's interesting to me to think about is that some of, you know, what explains some of the residuals in this relationship? There's a negative relationship, but there's also an awful lot of unexplained scatter that has to do with the traits of the species that are involved. Some things are big negative residuals in this relationship, so the human footprint causes them to move quite little in comparison to a typical species on that plot. Uh, they're, they're, they're affected a lot. And some species are big positive outliers. They're not affected much. They can still move quite well, even in places with a high human footprint index. So what maybe explains the variation in the strength of the effect 
of humans on movements when you're looking across species. Uh, and in thinking about that for this guild, this is where uh, you know, the competition and the movement come together. Uh, I think the adaptations for spatial avoidance of dominance competitors could reasonably be argued to be sort of a pre-adaptation to be able to move through landscapes that are made unsuitable for other reasons too. So the logic here is that uh, one of the two alternative hypotheses I'm gonna present, I'm calling the competition movement hypothesis. And the idea here is that the species that are subordinates in, in, within this, this guild uh, have a lot of adaptations to spatially avoid dominant competitors. In every ecosystem where the question's been asked, evidence has been found that cheetahs and wild dogs behaviorally avoid places with high densities of lions and spotted hyenas. If adaptations that you use to avoid areas of, that are unsuitable because of competitors also allow you to avoid areas that, areas that are unsuitable because of people, um, this would give them a good ability to move through bad places. So it's not obvious that it would work that way, but it might. If you think about you know, what, adaptation, what adaptations cause spatial avoidance of a competitor, it could be as simple as when I bump into something that I assess to be a risk, I move, in, I move faster and more linearly. I want to get out of the location where the encounter occurred. If that's the adaptation, then an encounter with people may well provoke the same sort of response. Get linear and move fast to get out of an area that, that's bad conditions. So if that's the way this mechanism works, the species that are adapted to avoid competitors may also be pre-adapted to, to, to get through areas that we've made less suitable because they're good at moving through unsuitable areas. That would cause them to be relatively little affected by areas of a high human, high human impact. So you'd be protecting, predicting under this hypothesis that the subordinate competitors are the ones that are fairly resistant to human modification of the landscape and the dominant competitors are the ones that aren't resistant to it because they're not good at avoiding bad places. They can just stay where they want to be under, under natural conditions. On the other hand, competition also, I, the reason I was asking you to remember the scales on those graphs earlier is that competition has a big effect on the densities of these species as well. And in every ecosystem studied, the subordinate competitors have lower densities than the dominant competitors probably as a consequence of the competition. So because the subordinate competitors are always at low population density relative to the dominant competitors, that could also affect connectivity, but in the opposite direction. Large populations have more potential diverse dispersers. So all else equal, large populations tend to be better connected than small ones. Uh, and large populations also experience less genetic drift than small ones and therefore genetic differentiation between populations is expected to be lower in big populations than in small ones, all else equal. So if this hypothesis is correct, we should see the opposite pattern. You should see little impact of human modification of the landscape on the dominant competitors and pretty strong effects of human modification of the landscape on the subordinate competitors. So really the issue boils down to is which of these is the stronger effect? The effect on population size or the effect on individual ability to move, uh, working in opposite directions. So that's what we set out to test uh, using high throughput sequencing to get single, nucleo poly single nucleotide polymorphism genotypes across thousands of loci for a couple hundred individuals uh, in several different ecosystems. So the three ecosystems that I mentioned before we sampled in uh, and we looked at connectivity between each pair of ecosystems for wild dogs and for lions. But there was one complication here in that the lion population in Lua is directly due to translocation of lions from Kafui. So we know the genetic similarities between this, ecosystem, this pair of ecosystems doesn't mean anything for lions. So we excluded lions from Lua and we added in the nearest ecosystem that we could include that would be comparable, which was the Salu Game Reserve in southern Tanzania. So for lions, we're comparing Salu in Tanzania, Luangwa, and Kafui. And for wild dogs, we're also using Luangwa and Kafui, but in Lua. Um, so a little bit of imperfection in the design, but we can't ignore the translocation. Uh, so we got genotypes at 2,500 loci for wild dogs and 3,500 for the lions. 
uh, for about 100 wild dogs and about 200 lions in the three ecosystems that I just mentioned. And by weird coincidence, this paper is coming out later today. Um, so good timing. You're the first to know by about four hours. Um, this is just for people who are not familiar with it, a quick two slide description of how these genotypes are obtained. Um, and this department seems to be fairly evolutionary. Um, so probably a lot of you know this quite well. But basically, uh, the blue is intended to be one individual and the yellow another individual. And for each of them, what we're looking at is a stretch of their genome. And these black locations are restriction sites where a given endonuclease will cut the genome. So um, when you're doing uh, restriction site associated sequencing, all you're doing is cutting the DNA with a restriction enzyme and then looking at the DNA that's associated with that cut site. So it's a way of selecting stretches of DNA that are distributed across the whole genome, but subsampling the genome instead of doing whole genome sequencing. So for us, what we were doing is using these RADs, which is this DNA associated with a place that was cut by the ECO-R1 enzyme that cuts where that sequence occurs. Uh, and then you size select these to get the fraction of the genome that you want, which in our case was about 3%. So we're sequencing about 3% of the genome of each of these individuals. And then you take the sequence data to align fragments so that you know that you're looking at the same stretch of DNA um, for a given individual. And that's what's uh, done with this uh, software called Stacks. So this Stacks software is literally taking the sequence data and aligning it. Uh, so that you see, you know, here we have maybe 150 base pairs or something like that that's invariant. So that's how we know we're looking at the same chunk of DNA, even though we're getting lots of fragments of DNA from lots of individuals. We're just letting the bioinformatics sort it out under the assumption that if you get that sequence of base pairs that far along, you have to be looking at the same stretch of DNA. So I don't know what four to the power of 150 is, but if you punch that into your phone and take the reciprocal, it's gonna be a teeny little number. Uh, the odds of this not being the same stretch of DNA are very low. So when you see uh, variation at a single base pair, that's what a SNP is. That's a single nucleotide polymorphism. So you find these loci that are polymorphic within these stretches that aren't. You, uh, and in our case, we had a minimum stack depth where this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten a stack depth of 10. We didn't use data where we didn't have a stack depth of at least 30 so that we were confident that we weren't looking at genotyping areas, errors. We were, we were looking at genuine genetic variation. So with that in hand, uh, we could look at genetic variability um, and, and use it to look at how genetically similar or dissimilar these species are within and across ecosystems to test those hypotheses that I was just laying out for you. So uh, when you have data like this, the problem you have is that uh, if, my, if the, the rows that I'm laying out for you here are the individuals and the columns are the loci, you know, we have literally three and a half thousand columns of information, three and a half thousand traits that we're looking at variation in across these individuals. So in order to, to describe that variation in an interpretable way, the most common thing to do is use some kind of ordination technique like principal components analysis. So what PCA does is it takes these three and a half thousand loci and it looks at the variation amongst individuals and it makes linear combinations of those many variables, those many loci, where the, the first principal component is the, the linear combination of them that explains the most variation in the data that is possible. And then the second principal component explains as much of the remaining variation as possible. And then the third principal component and so on. You're just taking a highly dimensional data set and reducing it to a smaller number of dimensions. And we're plotting here the first two of those components, but the analysis is based on more than just the first two. You just can't look at it very easily. And rather than using principal components analysis, we used a method called uh, T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding uh, or T-SNE. This has been developed uh, relatively recently. <laughs> People are laughing. It does sound T-SNE. It's kind of funny. Um, it was developed by this guy, Lawrence Vandermotten, who's an artificial intelligence guru. 
Uh, and it's been shown to perform better than most of the, the, the longer standing methods like PCA or principal coordinates analysis or non-metric non dimensional scaling. So against benchmark data sets, this does very well um, when you know the answer and you're seeing if you can find it. Um, so that's why we use TSNI. And this Lawrence Vandermotten has a great, um, there's a YouTube that he presents on this method if you have a need to use or ordination or he was talking to the people at Google who use this stuff for um, things like facial recognition um, where he explained why it works so well, uh, which is what caused me to use it. Um, so I'd recommend it to you if you have this kind of data. But what it shows in this case is the genetic differentiation is much more distinct for lions than it is for wild dogs. Lions are quite dissimilar to one another across ecosystems, uh, whereas, lion, whereas wild dogs, the mo there is more variation within the Luangwa Valley ecosystem than there is between the Luangwa Valley ecosystem and other ecosystems. So this is the signature of good connectivity, low differentiation between ecosystems. And this is the signature of less connectivity, more differentiation between ecosystems. So this first cut is suggesting that the movement hypothesis wins. The wild dogs are better connected because of their individual capacity for movement, even though they exist at much lower population densities, which should cause better connectivity. So the effects of individual movement seem to outweigh the effects on density. But that doesn't show that it has anything to do with human activity or the human footprint. So to look at that, what we did is we downloaded this human footprint index. Again, this is available on Dryad from the, the authors of that paper. Uh, so for any area that you're interested in, you can download the human footprint index and all the eight components if you want to reweight them in a different way uh, for your species. Um, and look at how they explain movement or connectivity. So that's what we're looking at here. This is the outline of Zambia. Uh, and you can see these hot spots with high human footprint index, which if you know African geography at all, these are all these African mega capitals. This is Lusaka with, uh, with millions of people. This is Harare with millions of people. This is Lilongwe, the capital of Malawi with millions of people. That's Bujumbura in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this up here is a series of large cities in northern Zambia that fall in what's called the Copper Belt. So um, this band here with relatively high human footprint index is the capital connected to an area with really high resource availability. Uh, there's a lot of copper mines up there, which actually explains the shape of the country. This weird intrusion of Congo into Zambia as a holdover from colonial days when Belgians controlled the Congo and basically said, you know what, there's a lot of resources there, we'll have that. Um, that's what that little peninsula is there, is, is it's resource driven. So you have this belt here of high human footprint and you have other areas with these darker colors where the human footprint is low. You can see the Luangwa ecosystem here on that map and you can see the Kafui ecosystem there on that map with, with low, 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 low mapped index. So to look at how that might affect the carnivores, we used what's uh, called isolation by resistance this is a pretty well-established idea now. It's been around for a while, but what Brad McRae argued is that when you're looking at connectivity and gene flow, you can think of the connections between deems, where this is two different deems, and these are rates of gene flow between the two as being analogous to two nodes in a circuit that are connected by pathways that have varying resistance. So he just took a theory straight from physics and applied it to this issue saying, if the analogy between deems and gene flow between them uh, is, works the same way as resistance in circuits, we can just take established theory and, and steal it. Uh, so that's what this figure here shows is basically this is like a, ma a, a, a map of the landscape that's been mapped out into rasters where each one of these cells has a resistance where the dark ones are high resistance and the light ones are low resistance. And what McRae's method does is assume that there are many paths between these two locations, that current can flow from A to B through any one of those cells, and it's the integrated effect across all the pathways that determines the connectivity. I think that's a good model for large carnivores. I think if you're looking at the Kafui ecosystem in central Zambia and the Luangwa ecosystem in eastern Zambia, it's not just a matter of how well do they get down a corridor between the two. 
It's that there's an infinite number of ways between the two that vary in their resistance, and therefore this is probably a good way of modeling it. So we fit a, a, a resistance model to the human footprint index for uh, the geographic area that we're interested in, and that's what you're seeing here. So this is sort of the take home of the whole thing now, where the points, uh, uh, the colors of the points show genetic similarity. This is the uh, similarity index from the ordination we were talking about before. So points of similar color are genetically similar to one another across two and a half or three and a half thousand loci. The, the location of the points in the xy axis shows you geographic isolation, how far apart they were in space. And the color of the base map is showing you current fit to that, uh, a resistance model fit to the human footprint index. So the areas like this with these hotter colors are places where current should flow. They should be able to move through those areas relatively easily. And the places that are darker colored are places where current shouldn't flow, that are hard to get through because of a high human footprint. So we use that data for lions over here and for wild dogs over here to look at the correlation between genetic distance and geographic distance and to look at the correlation between genetic distance and what's called resistance distance, the total resistance between the locations on that color-coded map there. And what you can see, uh, you can kind of see it just by looking at the points. You know, These colors are very different than these colors. That's a replication of the ordination that we saw before, basically. But now we can directly test the correlation of those genetic differentiation with distance and with human resistance. And what you see is the correlation is low for wild dogs by either measure. So they're not too isolated by distance, and they are also not very isolated by human modification of the landscape so far for these three ecosystems. Uh, whereas lions are quite isolated by distance, and I think importantly, the correlation is strengthened appreciably when we look at human modification of the landscape. So what I would argue, or what I, yeah, what I will be arguing in four hours when this paper is published, is that's evidence that we've already modified their evolutionary trajectory. You know, we can explain more about genetic differentiation in lions using the human footprint than we can by using isolation by distance. So there's a, you know, we've got our signature on their genetic differentiation already for lions, but not for wild dogs. So returning to the hypotheses I was talking about, I think this is pretty good evidence that at least for this set of ecosystem and this pair of species, that the effect of competition on individual movement seems to affect connectivity more than the effect on population density. Now there's a lot of alternative explanations still lurking out there that could explain these patterns too. So I think this is more a result that calls for more data than it is uh, you know, a conclusion about how it works. We need more ecosystems and we need more species pairs. And that's uh, actually what we intend to be working on. Uh, yeah, so the data come down on the side of movement rather than density. I'm gonna jump forward a little bit here just to point out that we've enlisted a bunch of collaborators. So each of the gray dots on that map is locations where we're gonna be getting data for at least one of these carnivore species. And for some of these locations, all of them. So we're up now to 22 ecosystems and five species. And we're basically just trying to fill in the matrix of getting the complete set of species across a large set of ecosystems. Where instead of just looking at three ecosystems and two species, we can see whether individual movement capacity or population density is the better predictor across a larger data set. Uh, so, uh, and again, what I'd like to sort of emphasize in general is interspecific competition is ubiquitous. There's probably nobody in this room that studies anything that isn't affected by competition. Uh, and in a lot of guilds, spatial niche partitioning is a big, big part of the response to interspecific competition. So uh, the things that are driving the patterns that I'm describing or thinking about, I think may have effect in other guilds. So when you're thinking back to that map showing how the human footprint affects, you know, some species are big positive residuals and some species are big negative residuals. Yeah, we know species traits affect connectivity, but there's still room for a lot of development of the theory about what traits are most important. A lot of that work has sort of been hunting for things that correlate, like body mass. 
because we have the data. Uh, but there are probably going to be things like what I'm talking about here that are good predictors. You know, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. The data are still too sparse to say about what are good predictors here. But uh, I think this is a productive way forward to be thinking about how human impacts are going to affect connectivity, is to try to be working from theory to make predictions about what traits should matter and then test those hypotheses rather than just sort of going fishing and seeing what traits correlate with connectivity. This may be a good way forward. Um, I real quickly want to add that these genotypes are useful not only for the kinds of questions I asked, but also more directly, uh, we're using them to, uh, there's a rising trade in big cat body parts. So as tigers have been depleted, that market has shifted to African carnivores. And there's a big market emerging just now in African lion body parts, cheetah body parts, leopard body parts. These genotypes have more than enough information for me to get a sample from a skin and relate it to the genetic data that I was just describing for you. And I can tell the, the, the government, yeah, that lion that you confiscated in Lusaka, that came from Luangwa. That one there, that came from Lua. Um, so we can, we can tell where the traffic was coming from. Because if you look at this map, the seizures of wildlife traffic are not in the national parks. You know, the seizures are on, on the trafficking routes. So we don't really know where it came from. But, but we can certainly provide an answer to that question with the kind of data that we're talking about. So uh, yeah, that's, that's all I have. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. So that does sort of make sense that one thing the small carnivores might do is broaden their, their dietary niche in order to not rely as much on this, you know, to, to avoid the things that the dominant carnivores are doing. I agree that's logical, but that's not really how the data look. Um, so if you compare the diet breadth of the small carnivores to the large carnivores, uh, it does not tend to be broader. It tends to be just more focused on the small species. So actually in the 1960s data, the lion was the one with the broadest dietary niche back then, and it compressed in on the diet of the smaller carnivores. Um, so yeah, it's logical, but it just doesn't seem, seem to work that way. Yeah? Is your evidence that the lower protein activity causes lower thickness of the So we don't know that. I mean, the question was, do the, does the decreased connectivity have fitness consequences because of inbreeding? We do not know um, uh, and haven't tested. Um, I think what we're going to try to do is just better establish if what we've seen so far is a general pattern, that we do, in fact, see more differentiation in the dominant carniv carnivores than in the subordinates, and then start looking at the consequences. Um, but yeah, it would make sense that you know, loss of genetic variability could have, could have effects. These are populations, again, of a few dozens to a few hundreds. And the effective population size is only about a tenth to a fifth of the, of the census population size. So they're plenty small enough for inbreeding to be a potential issue. But we don't know. That has been argued for lions in the Ngorongoro crater. So that's one uh, population that was argued to be not at all well genetically connected to other populations. And it went through a bottleneck. There was a, a biting fly outbreak that caused the lion population to decrease to just a few dozen. Uh, and there was a series of papers in Nature and Science basically arguing that that genetic bottleneck had fitness consequence for those lions. I will say I know a PhD student who's working there now and put GPS collars on, and they don't look nearly as isolated as the argument was, so um, stay tuned. So we don't know uh, because nobody knows what the integral predation was back in the 60s there. Um, but we certainly can say that for wild dogs in Kafui now, lions are an important limiting factor. Um, yeah, we have uh, had a few cases of, lions are too lazy to work hard at anything. But lions will dig up a wild dog den to kill their puppies. Um, so they'll find the den and they'll spend a couple hours excavating it, kill the puppies, admire their fine work and move on. They don't even eat them. 
Um, so yeah, this is an important limiting factor. Um, yeah. So like in Botswana, where Tico McNutt has studied African wild dogs for decades now, the single most important cause of death is lion predation. Yeah, so that's a great point that, you know, we could, you know, ask whether the prediction about how they respond to negative encounters does affect their short-term movements. And we do have data on that. So one of my master's students is working on that right now. Um, in the Luangwa ecosystem in particular, dogs are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. They can be in the national park where they have a high encounter rates with lions, but good prey availability. But they can leave the national park to the game management areas where they have much lower probability of encounter with lions, but prey depletion due to snaring, increased odds of being snared themselves, and higher encounter rates with humans. So he's looking at their movement patterns using GPS collars and looking at their hunting behavior using accelerometers, you know, in those two, two kinds of the landscape. Yeah, yeah, good question. I don't know the answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, you know, are the species for sort of a given level of human impact in a location, uh, are humans just more actively a barrier to some carnivores than others? And, and you know, they probably are. Uh, but the short answer is um, in areas with animal agriculture, you know, the antipathy towards all of them is pretty high. Um, so the conflict is, is, you know, it's there for all of them. Is it equally important for all of them? I don't know. And that's one of the things we want to test. You know, the next, one of the next things we're going to do is take each of those components of the human footprint and ask which of those may be the best predictor by themselves. That may be a way to get at that a little bit. You know, if animal agriculture is a big part of the effect on some species but on other, not others, you could maybe fish it out that way. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, the other thing is, you know, some are more nocturnal and some less. So the probability of directly observing them there is affected by that. Are the, um, are the prey species that destroy, um, have the most chance for destroying the prey that will affect the people's population density or the movement patterns of either the lion or the wild dog the areas where they are? Yeah, so like I say, you know, that was kind of the complication with the 1960s to now comparison is we don't have good prey data from the 1960s. But almost certainly, yes. Um, the only way that lions could have had the diet that they had back in the 60s is if the prey community was different than it is now, in my opinion. I don't think there's any other plausible explanation for what we found. So we have diet then and diet now, prey community now, but we don't have prey community then. Right. Right, and it could be either one. Given what we've done so far, there's no way we could fish those apart. Um, but yeah, I agree. Probably both are important. So it's a bit like the effects of snaring on their demography. Uh, the snares kill them, but the main effect actually is the snares reduce the availability of their prey. Yeah. Um, well, y yeah, um, let's see if we can go backward really fast. The whole talk, <laughs> quick review, there'll be a quiz. Um, oh no, I already went by it, sorry. Don't know my own slides. Yeah, I mean, so there you're seeing the variation from nation to nation. Maybe the color map is not as good as it may, could be, maybe. But yeah, in some senses, yeah, like, you know, you compare India to Australia, there's a lot of variation, yeah. Um, within Sub-Saharan Africa, 
it's, it's more variable at fine scales than it is from country to country, but yeah, there's a lot of variation. Um, yeah, uh, Eastern US, Western US. Yeah, if you think about that missing three billion birds paper, you can tell why the three billion are missing from over here and not from over here. Um, yeah.